We turn now to a new book about conspiracy theories and their role in American political history. Take a look at this. Political paranoia and conspiracy theories in particular have been a part of uh, the United States since before there was a United States, going back to the colonial era across the political spectrum, left wing, right wing, and the center. Um, it's, we're not just talking about people on the fringes uh, or outsiders, but often people at the very heart of American power. I know that. Conspiracy theories have been an entrenched part of American politics for centuries, from the Red Scare to the 9-11 truthers. Author Jesse Walker argues these beliefs aren't theories to be debunked so much as folklore to be examined. He joins me now uh, in studio. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, one of the things I love about your book, and I have it here, I got it yesterday, um, is that it, it, it draws on everything, sociology, anthropology, political science, uh, history. What brought you to this topic of, of paranoia and conspiracy theories? Oh my, it's, sometimes I'm not quite sure. It, it's like a hidden, hidden hand drew me towards it, right? <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I've been reading conspiracy theories of different kinds since I was a teenager. You know, I was right. actually reading serious investigations of like the FBI, the CIA, stuff that came out in the 70s after Watergate. And often they were next to other books on the shelves that were a bit more dubious, but were still fun to read. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I guess I kept exploring. Uh, and, and the result is your book. Now, we got some polling on this. This is a PPP poll mm -hmm. uh, where they interviewed voters in uh, April of 2013. 51% of these voters uh, say that some sort of a larger conspiracy was at work in the JFK assassination. I'm actually surprised it's so low. I'm surprised it's not like 75%. It, it used to be higher. Yeah, yeah. and then 28% of voters believe uh, there is a new world order. I, I don't know if that's like the trilateral commission or Illuminati. so many to choose from. And then 15% of voters say, uh, that uh, the government or the media uh, adds controlling technology to TV content, mm -hmm. perhaps. I mean, if that would make people watch, I might be uh, up for that. But why do people actually buy into these theories? Well, well how do they sort of operate? Well, it, there's no one single answer to yeah. that. I mean, they come from different, um, from different places. Um, but I'll say there's three things that are important to keep in mind. First of all, we are naturally pattern-seeking people. We look for narratives. We, when we see uh, the signals, we try to turn it into uh, something we can make sense of. And, and is that because our, we don't really have any control over our lives, that fate actually sort of determines well, everything? Well, the, that's the, the second thing is that it's especially um, when you're dealing with something that frightens you yeah. or with people that frighten you or a situation that frightens you, you're naturally going to come to a more fearful story. And then the third thing is people do actually conspire sometimes. It's not like being afraid of zombies or you know werewolves. Right. There's enough historical examples of people conspiring that people say, well, maybe this one's true too. Yeah, yeah. I, and you talk about the 1970s, for instance, mm -hmm. as the golden age of what you call enemy above mm -hmm. uh, conspiracy theories, what, and you outlined five of them. Right. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that, the sort of categories yeah, of the, conspiracy uh, theories? The five general categories I have, sort of the same narratives that keep happening again and again, are the enemy above, right. which is seeing a conspiracy at you know the government or powerful corporations and so on. The enemy below, which are the conspiracies people, uh, conspiracy theories that powerful people have, um, the enemy outside, uh, the enemy within, and then the benevolent conspiracy, which right. people don't talk about as much, yeah. but there are ideas of you know, secret societies guiding America towards a grander destiny, uh -huh. um, aliens, angels, so on. So. Where do you think we are now in terms of our conspiracy theories? You talk about the 1970s and 1970s, uh, 1970s and 90s, as that golden age of sort of enemy above, and right. I'm sure Nixon uh, did a lot to help that. Where do you think we are now? It, it, well, we don't have historical perspective on where we are right now, but I will say the two things that are sort of interesting to watch as these kind of NSA revelations come out First of all, people with good reason are suspicious about what their government is doing. Right. And second of all, the government is scared of leakers. Yeah, I mean, things yeah. like this insider threat program, yeah. it, it's like a, a replay of some of the, like the Red Scare and Lavender Scare and so on that I write about in the book. 
Um, and that's an example of sort of an enemy below or enemy within phenomenon. Yeah, sort of Washington terrified of itself exactly. and paranoid of its own self. W if you could talk about and maybe tease out a couple of uh, conspiracy theories, there was one uh, in the 80s and 90s, and maybe it's still around, certainly when I get into uh, cabs, sometimes cab drivers talk about this conspiracy that the government created, uh, HIV and AIDS. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, that has many different sources. Um, I mean, one that I, the one place that sort of comes up in the book was in the 1980s, the idea of, you know, black doc, I mean, sorry, white doctors and uh, injecting black babies with AIDS. Right. And, and I write about how obviously this wasn't true, but this comes on the heels of uh, so much, you know, abusive and high-handed treatment of black people by white doctors, right. including things like the Tuskegee experiment. That makes it easier for stories like that to catch on, right. even when the evidence isn't there for them. Right. And is it your sense that sort of modern technology, or what role does modern technology, be it social media or just the mere fact that we can do all sorts of things, uh, d does that play a role in conspiracy theories or the rampantness of conspiracy theories? Well, it certainly helps transmit them. Yeah. You know, I mean, and it's. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff I write about in this book, I'm fortunate that sociologists went out and tracked rumors in the 1940s yeah. and so on. Nowadays, you can watch it happen in real time on yeah. Facebook. So I, I don't know that that, um, that, that uh, means there's more paranoia, but it does mean also that uh, different stories can mix together more easily. You can have uh, the UFO people and the militia people and you know black nationalists and so on listening to one another and mixing the different stories together. And that's what you say, that these cut across all socioeconomic and racial uh, backgrounds. I think mm -hmm. this maybe one popular theory, if you're on the left at least, is that you know the people mm -hmm. on the right have their conspiracy theories, and then if you're on the right, you believe uh, things about George Soros or whatever. But you mm -hmm. think it's, it, it cuts across all boundaries. Yeah, and I think yeah. the center has its own conspiracy theories. I yeah. think uh, the establishment has conspiracy theories that often you don't recognize as conspiracy theories till a few decades later and you right. say wow when we were really into you know the satanic panic in the 1980s that was insane but uh, it yeah I think um, since the beginning of the United States in fact before the beginning of the United States I go into the colonial era um, political paranoia has uh, just permeated uh, political life. And surrounded those early interactions uh, mm -hmm. that uh, Americans had with Native Americans oh, absolutely. and thinking that they were essentially Satan's spawn or co-conspirators yeah. with Satan. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the most extreme version yeah. was uh, there was a story that um, Satan had actually settled uh, the New World with pagans from the Old World because they were, the gospel was spreading there. But even beyond that, even beyond that stuff that's sort of self-evidently nutty, there was right. this natural tendency, I mean, because there was a such thing as Indian attacks, yeah. you know, to be worried about the next Indian attack and to imagine um, different tribes uh, collaborating with each other in secret and um, often to sort of mistake um, the Indian social structure, it's thinking it's gonna look like the Western uh, social structure. So you imagine um, an influential Indian as a grand conspirator, a sort of a loose network as an empire. And that fed into all kinds of uh, stories, which I mean, we see reverberations of them today, I think. Popular conspiracy theories today, mm -hmm. uh, the truthers, what do you make of that one? I, you know, I mean, the, the truthers, I, I, I call them a sideshow in this because I, I feel like um, while they're fun to read about and, and, and to look at, the sort of paranoia that really gripped the country after 9-11 was the kind that had people seeing spilled coffee uh, sweetener in the, um, in the airport lounge and thinking that, you know, Al-Qaeda was planning an attack right there, right then. Yeah. You know? I, I write about... Um, one thing in uh, Texas, they found like the sort of jerry-rigged contraption in someone's mailbox, uh, and there was a, it, they, it turned out to be a, a child's uh, a science project. Yeah. But um, not only did they sort of shut down the area, but even after they found out what it was, they still confiscated it just in <laughs> right, case. Right, just in case. Yeah, and that to me, I mean, that's sort of the example of the political center was having you know, its own uh, conspiracy theories yeah. then. Um, and we were, I mean, I certainly got worried after 9-11, yeah. right? And, and, and that was in sort of a time of national panic, but you also make the argument that in times of peace, uh, still these sort mm -hmm. of conspiracy theories abound as well. Yeah, and in the 1990s, it comes yeah. between the Cold War and then the War on Terror, a time of relative prosperity. But that was a golden age of 
I mean, uh, not just things like the New World Order theories and so on, but also in fiction. You know, The X-Files was a very popular TV yeah. show. Um, so I, I think peace can breed nightmares too. Yeah, Illuminati. Uh, yeah. I, I have a, a friend who I mentor actually, and she swears that Beyonce is in the Illuminati. I, had, mm -hmm. I don't even know what the Illuminati is. I guess I've heard it every mm -hmm. once in a while in rap lyrics, but uh, talk about that. Yeah, that's, that's a big topic um, <laughs> because the historical group, the Bavarian Illuminati, was started in 1776 in Bavaria, sort of a rationalist organization, secret society, um, was then cracked down upon because you know, the government didn't like having the secret society around. And ever since then, there have been theories about it surviving and organizing the French Revolution, uh, being behind Thomas Jefferson when it came to the United States, so planning uh, some sort of uh, massive uh, invasion that would include like, starting slave revolts you right. know, across the South. Um, and it, it's taken different forms over the years. Um, in the mid-70s, uh, a very funny book, Illuminatus, was written, which is a parody of conspiracy theories, and that kind of brought the Illuminati, Illuminati back into popular culture, and, and then recently it's been very big in you know, hip-hop, yeah. as you mentioned. Uh, Jay-Z had a lyric that said, I said I was a Mason, not a Mason, right. because he was tired <laughs> of the... But yeah, yeah, so that's, um, yeah. They, they keep coming up in the book. And yeah. so what is the danger of, of conspiracy theories? Is there a danger or are they just sort of harmless folklore? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, it, I mean, for one thing, there's nothing wrong with having a theory about a possible conspiracy. We're yeah. sitting here in the Washington Post. People here have exposed storied conspiracies yes, in the right. past. Um, and, there's, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, you know, challenging you know, an official narrative, trying to say, be skeptical and uh, say, I, I want to find out if this is the full truth. Right. The flip side is you also have to be skeptical about all the alternative narratives yeah. that people come up with. Um, and as far as dangers, I mean, it's the danger of uh, that could happen whenever um, somebody gets uh, becomes a true believer. Yeah, you know? birthers. Uh, what do you make of, of that whole movement? Birthers. Yeah, that's that's faded a bit. Well, I guess now that we have the Ted Cruz birthers. Yeah, that's not, although that's not a conspiracy. <laughs> but he's renounced thing. his uh, yeah, his Canadian renounced citizen. Canada yeah. and all its works. I, I have. Um, I, you know, I, th I mentioned like three or four different sort of reasons for birtherism beyond just some people, you know, thinking the evidence is true because they haven't looked at all the debunking. Um, right. It actually originated among supporters of Hillary Clinton yeah. before it migrated to the right. This idea that yeah. one fatal thing yeah, would I mean, there was, they Obama's want, candidacy. They wanted a magic bullet that would, you know, without the pain of political persuasion, right. you could bring someone down. On top of that, obviously, there's the sort of fear of the, out, I mean, the enemy outside, I mentioned, of, of the foreign. Mm -hmm. uh, and, Manchurian you know, candidate sort of thing. Yeah, and, and so when Barack Obama, who in addition to being half black, um, grew up, you know, at different places like Indonesia. I mean, the state that he's from, Hawaii, is the one American state that's not in the Americas. Right. Someone who's um, sort of uncomfortable with the idea of a multicultural America is going to see birtherism as, a, I mean, it, it's metaphorically true for that person, even right. if it isn't true, true. Yeah. And so that helps stories like that spread. Yeah. Is it any... I, I guess, is it worth it trying to debunk conspiracy theories or is it just a matter of even if you put information out there, it only fuels the conspiracy theory? Well, I, I mean, it, it's, it, you could say that about any story that's yeah. not true. Is it worth it to debunk it? Yeah. Um, and I, I think that um, yeah, there are conspiracy theorists who are, very, are true believers and will grind their heels in. There are conspiracy theorists who are very open to evidence, you know, and they, they just like examining. They'll say, well, maybe this guy killed JFK. Oh, no, maybe not. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for debunking stories that are not true, including right. conspiracy stories. Um, but sometimes I, I don't know if it's worthwhile trying to debunk debunk the idea the president is a lizard man. At that point, right. you're in like a religious uh, area more than a uh, normal, uh, that, that's more a matter of faith, I think, for people yeah. who and, embrace and you, it. And you certainly talk about how pop culture and, and mm -hmm. films and novels sort of feed into conspiracy well, they, And they feed on them. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just part of how stories are, are transmitted. Yeah. I, I think that um, it, it, both in the sort of the literal sense that you have uh, people who I like, read like H.P. Lovecraft horror stories and think the Necronomicon is real and they start working it in. But also we, when we, uh, we sort of organize um, those narratives I mentioned earlier based on the sort of the narratives we've seen before. And so yeah. what we've seen in the movies, you know, or read in a book obviously influences, um, I think it influences the way true stories are told. You know, I mean, I, I think that there are stories in newspapers and books that are absolutely true, but people, they're looking for that three-act structure that a Hollywood screenwriter uses. 
Jesse, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Good luck with your book. Is it out already? It or comes out today. Okay, awesome. We are on top of it. Thanks so much for joining me uh, today uh, to check out his book. Here it is, United States of Paranoia. For more on those conspiracies, it's available today on Amazon or wherever you want to buy it. Also, thanks to Dr. Corey A. Bear. We had some tech issues there. And Teresa Rangham for being here. Tweet your thoughts on today's show using the hashtag postback. See you back here tomorrow.